critical factor. So that's just a broad context. Now, another critical issue to um, handling, on a national scale anyway, um, the achievements that we can um, generate within the educational system is the systematic approach that we might adopt to education. And um, I've spent quite a lot of time recently in the States and also in Australia, um, where they've very much taken on the response to intervention approach, which many of you may have heard of, but they are applying it incredibly systematically. And this is viewed as the best practice approach, particularly to um, preventing the um, children from failing to be detected as having learning difficulties and failing to address these promptly. And the recommendation is that this a tiered approach is taken and considered to be a best practice. And this tiered approach is entrenched within the education system as a whole rather than something that, that's helicoptered in for a particular child. So the first expectation, the first tier, for example, in reading instruction, that's one example, is that the instruction that's delivered is the best research-informed effective instruction. So the instruction method shouldn't be chosen on the basis of necessarily the school preference, but on terms, in terms of the best available evidence about what's going to benefit um, children on average um, within that population. So that's what we might reasonably expect of our children when they go to school, that they receive the best research-informed effective education. For children who aren't faring very well at an early stage, the second tier of approach is introduced, and that's small group work. So the child might be identified as a group, one of a group of, ch of children who are struggling learners. This often happens within the classroom. And they're given extra instructional focus instruction. Um, weekly monitoring is recommended, so the, where the, the, the child's progress is tracked. And also parental liaison, so where um, information is fed back to the families. The families are also engaged in this, just this early approach to recognising that the child isn't doing too well and maybe needs some extra help, and can be, which can be reinforced at home. And then the third step is intensive inter individual in intervention. And this would only be introduced if the first two um, tiers are actually failing and the child still isn't progressing. So unless these first two um, tiers have been adopted, then the third intensive intervention isn't adopted, and then the child might be referred for special education support and maybe um, additional resources to come in. So um, a wholly systematic approach to make sure that children don't slip through the net, and um, really to avoid situations that I think maybe some of us anecdotally, certainly my own experience of a parent, um, may have had, which is that actually quite often you know that a child's struggling but the school isn't detecting, the school isn't taking um, e extra action and actually you feel as a parent it's necessary to, to bring that to their attention but a much more systematic approach where the, the progress of all children is monitored. So this is a good way of making sure that um, resources are effectively and economically um, allocated and actually on a fair basis too. Um, so you'll see that the critical first step is research-informed effective instruction. So what might that be? And there is quite a lot of evidence um, about what can work incredibly well. <clears throat> so, for example, um, the work of Maggie Snowling and Charles Hume and their group, they've done some great work looking at very early interventions, particularly focusing on um, children who are at risk of developing reading problems or who have problems with language. And this is just one of many studies, the Boyer crane study, that showed that very early phonological training, um, when the children are aged four to five in the first year of school, benefits um, literacy development um, in particular. So there's this very close relationship that many of us know about phonological awareness, for example, and the, um, the child's early abilities to get reading up and going, so that vital first step. But also the training in oral language, um, and a sort of flexibility of, of oral language and plenty of open-ended practice with a variety of different exercises, that boosts language abilities too. And there may be something very special about that particular developmental period, that if we're going to focus on language development, then it may be too late four or five years later. Um, so there's a particular developmental period in which the, 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 the system is still fine-tuning, even a typically development developing child and that might be a particularly important point at which to intervene so it suggests that timeliness is really important and that really that sort of timeliness these types of activities are going to be vital for that first step 
the whole, the whole class research informed effective instruction. And actually within the UK, certainly at the, end, the phonics end, I think we're doing rather well. In other countries, that's not the case and it's still up for debate. Um, I just wanted to identify some other um, research evidence, though, that I think is also, also important and I don't think is <coughs> so systematically applied. Um, and I, the, the reference here is to a um, very contentious and I think very erudite book written by Joe Elliott and Elena Grigorenko in 2014 on dyslexia um, and really challenging um, current practice in the field of dyslexia. And what they did was they reviewed a very wide range of evidence showing that, I think, showing that phonologicals for reading difficulties are equally beneficial irrespective of the IQ level of the child. So it's not that they're only effective if the child has typical or relatively high levels of IQ, but the child who is struggling in all respects, including reading and in terms of IQ, will actually benefit to as great an extent with these types of interventions. And that really challenges notions that we might have about something being special about those children who, who have a very marked disparity between IQ and reading and making those a priority for um, our um, very sc scarce resources that, that can be um, um, focused on struggling learners. So I think <clears throat> there is still space for us to think very hard about what research-informed evidence is and to make sure that we are actually implementing that in the classroom.